I have a strange setup today. It's very strange indeed. It's, <laughs> you're gonna like this one. It's a sermon with three texts, <laughs> simply because I couldn't just use one. So if you'll open your Bibles, and I'm going to uh, use my tablet as well, to Romans, the third chapter. So Romans 3.24, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. That's the first of my texts. And as you can see on my tablet here, I have underlined being justified. The next text I'd like you to turn to is Romans 5, Romans 5.1. 5, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now you can see here, underlined, being justified. And then Romans 5, 9. These are my three texts. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. And you can see in Romans 5, 9, I have also here being and justified underlined in red. So I want to discuss why this concept of being justified. Every once in a while, we've got to pull out these basic concepts and make sure they're reinforced with you who have been listening for years and those who are just coming. You know, the first time I hear, heard the word justified, it scared me. I didn't understand. I heard Dr. Scott say it on justification, and it was kind of like, Ooh, that sounds very legal, very harsh. But as we begin to study this word, there's something rather beautiful that we can glean. I've said this before, but it bears repeating. The Bible we're reading from, I'm reading from the King James Version anyway, um, but the New Testament was not written in English. So what we have out of necessity, we must use certain concepts, borrow certain words, perhaps from other languages, to convey what the Greek language of the New Testament was trying to communicate. So I'd like for you first, where we're reading from Romans 3.24, I'd like to first make some serious notes here. We're looking at, in each case, Romans 3.24, Romans 5.1, and Romans 5.9, we're looking at those DK words uh, DK, the root in the Greek, which interestingly enough, um, because there was so much teaching on this word, Dr. Scott taught on it so much, most of you who were here remember at least the fact that DK, who was daughter of Zeus and became the per personified uh, concept of justice. Now I've got a, a dictionary that will help us a little bit with some of the concepts that people have tried to grapple with in explaining this word. And this, my friends, is where I pray patience for a future generation of people coming into the church who say, well, I just don't understand why you can't just agree with this one and, and, and these people can't all have the same ideas and doctrines. And the problem comes down to not, forgive me, if you're grappling over how you should read the English translation, I think we'll go on to the next room and we'll leave you there. It's the scholars that are grappling over what the Greeks should say. Those are the people that if you have to listen to somebody bang heads and drive you to neurosis, those are the people to listen to. They're at least dealing with the language frame that at least intrinsically will capture some kernel, some possibility of what the word may actually convey. What I'm saying to you is I've heard people that trying to disseminate the English and saying, well, the English word, da-da-da, and they'll go on to tell you about this English word, but unless you make sure to tell people that this English word probably came to us from Latin, the word for justified, probably came to us from the Latin frame of justice, justis, justicia, and from the language uh, frame tracing back before Latin, we're going to be hard pressed to make the connection into the Greek. So it's necessary that we at least look at this word and understand its basic meaning 
originally to the best of our ability. Because Paul is the writer and he was well versed in the Hebrew, the Hebrew equivalent to this word would be the word, I'll write it in the best phonetic that I can, tzedek. Tzedek. I missed a D there. Let's go back and we'll stick a D in there. Tzedek or tzedeka, which is righteous, right or righteousness of God. Now, I don't want to spend time trying to uh, explain beyond what this dictionary will help us to understand, but I do want us to understand, as I've circled these words, being justified, in each of these verses I'm highlighting, the Greek reveals something very important. Many of you come out of the background, some of you come out of the church that says if you're not doing something, you can't be saved. Now, this puts all of that to bed completely. Being justified, and let me write the Greek word on the top here. Being justified is one word in the Greek. Interesting that one word can carry with it. We need a helping word in English to make sure that we know it's a participle. But in the Greek, you, don't, you only need one word. So in the Greek, we have dikaiou, dikaiou menoi. And this is a verb. That means it's an action word. It's a participle. And that means that it, it splits itself acting like a verbal adjective, if you will. But here's the important thing. This first one is present and passive, and I'd like to explain this. The present is called, in Greek, if you were studying Greek, it's called aspect. It tells you when or how something takes place. So the present means it is ongoing, it's continuous, it's something that is not finished, but passive means you are the recipient. Now let me talk about voice, otherwise some of the people who just are coming will not understand. The Greek has voice. There's active voice, there's middle voice, and there's passive voice. So in the active voice in the, in the Greek, I would be doing something, the subject would be doing something, and that's all we know. I am doing something. I'm baking a cake. Middle voice, I'm baking a cake for myself. I'm doing it for me. In the passive, ooh, this could be good. Passive would be somebody else baked a cake for me, or I received a cake. I didn't make it. I didn't bake it. Do you get the point? This is the voice, the voice in the Greek. This becomes, these are the fundamental principles for understanding how people devise their doctrines of salvation. So what we have here, present, which means ongoing, and passive. We, we stood still and we received an action that's ongoing. So let's read in the context of that verse being justified, which I'm going to get to in a minute, let's just say being made right would be a, a better understanding. Being made right freely as a free gift by his grace, that is through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Now, I want you to wrap your mind around this. This particular verse, being justified, King James, suggests that it is continuous. It's an activity that continues while I am still living. I am still receiving this action. Let's read before this, because this is what becomes interesting. Right before, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That puts a lid on those people that say, well, but when you come into the church, you stop sinning, surely. You know what we're like? We're like people before the Spirit of God comes into our life. We're like people trapped in a room with no light. You ever decided at 3 o'clock in the morning you don't want to open the lights? You know your bedroom pretty much, kind of, maybe. But you decide you want to navigate the room in the dark. We're like that before the Spirit of God comes into our hearts. We're like that all the time, groping around, loathsome, Really, if you think about it, almost happy to be bumping around in the dark until the light comes. 
And once the light comes, this is what's so interesting, it's not an automatic, now I see. Sometimes the light comes and it takes a long time to stop walking around as if you're still in the dark. Most of us spend a good period of our quote-unquote Christian walk still bumping around, feeling out for what we were sure. Oh boy, don't go there. With something else in the dark, and it turns out to be something else when the scales fall off your eyes. Oh my goodness, was I latching onto that? <laughs> oh, you carnal ones, don't go there. <laughs> my point is that's what we're like. So understand the background to this. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God being justified freely by His grace, there is an activity going on that He, God, through His Son, Jesus Christ, because it's passive, we are the recipients on an ongoing basis, are placed in right standing. Now, in this particular verse, I've identified the verbal form. Let's see the verbal form in Romans 5.1, and we must kind of do them all, and then we can look at the big picture. In Romans 5.1, it seems we have the same thing. Therefore, being justified, except when we're reading this word from Romans 5, one word again, and slightly different. Thank goodness for this eraser. It's just so good. All right. So, dikaiusente is the Greek, and again, we have a verb, we have a participle, so same concept at the beginning, but here we have aorist and passive. Now, passive I just explained in the voice. That's the voice part of the expression in the Greek. We know it's not active, I'm not doing it. We know it's not middle, I'm not doing it for myself, but rather I'm receiving whatever is being done. So. Here we have being justified using the King James, but it's aorist. Now, this is what becomes important. Aorist represents an act in the past, unlike what we looked at at verse 24, present, which is ongoing and continuous. Aorist represents an activity in the past. So when we translate this back into English, there's a little lacking of being justified, we'd be better off to say having, because it is something that has passed already, and something effectuated in the past. Having been, even though that doesn't quite convey, having been, and let's do this, made, made right. God bless Dr. Scott, he coined some words. He liked to say righteousified. But I want you to be able to read this, and if somebody asks you, if you can at least use terminology that someone else will connect with. <laughs> so, having been made right by faith. And I want you to see immediately the difference between Romans 3.24 on my tablet, where we have the present and passive. It looks like the same words, looks like the same words, and here we have the aorist passive. So, one represents something that is ongoing, because the background is all have sinned. So it's not just a one-time justification thing. This, in Romans 3.24, is an ongoing, continuous being made right. In Romans 5.1, it's an act in the past. Why? Because if you read before what comes before, there was no chapter and verse when Paul wrote. It was a letter. Chapter and verse, as we know, was added much, much later we have what it says here that, in verse 24, but for us also, to whom it shall be imputed, if we believe, if we faith on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. Therefore, having been made right by faith. Now, you can do the homework of reading between Romans 3 and Romans 5. I want to den in a concept today that for, especially for those people that come and they say, you mean all I have to do is faith? It somehow seems so impossible that that could be the only way. You mean it's not some 50-50 co-op, you know, Jesus does a little and I do a little? Nope. I just say this to you. 
in the concept of salvation, in the understanding of salvation, it's either all or nothing. You're either looking at Jesus Christ, knowing your utter nakedness and nothingness before him and depending on his complete sufficiency, or you're not. And if there's anything else that gets added to, like the people that say, Jesus, but, you're going to find that the but usually entails you got to do, and you got to do, which basically says Jesus' work on the cross, it is finished, was not finished according to them. Now, if Jesus said it is finished, it is finished. And if the final word of it is finished is he is risen, he, he ascended, and he's coming again, that's a good final word for all of us, I think. No buts needed to be added to that one. <laughs> Lastly, here we have the same concept in Romans 5, 9. It's the same thing as Romans 5, 1. It's again a verb, a participle. It is uh, being now justified. It's the same as what we just saw. It's an aorist and it's passive. Now you might say this is a funny thing to highlight, much more than being now justified. And we're going to have to explain the now, but bear with me. Much more than being now justified, being having been made right. Now, by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. I'd like you to notice something, that every time the concept of being justified is mentioned, unless Paul or another writer is speaking of God who is the justifier, being justified is always in the passive voice. So the next time somebody comes to you and says, but what about your salvation? What works have you done? Well, you've been justified passively. See, these are, these are the ways that you determine. And I, I simply ask you, when I do these things, it seems like a great effort to bring forth these Greek words, and why do I have to learn about passive and aorist? And it's ridiculous, just tell me, and I'd rather show you so that you can be educated in understanding far more than somebody who's just going to flap their jaw and say, well, yes, but you got to do. No, there, there isn't any got to do. When it comes to the justification that God declares to us through his Son, we are receiving this. It is passive. If you're a grammarian, go check me out. And if you're not, maybe you ought to become a grammarian. Now. I've just showed you three, my three different texts. I'm not done with the text, but I do want to touch on the DK word. I elected to not go the usual route, which would have been the theological dictionary of the New Testament, which is the purple dictionary I normally bring to you. But I decided after reading it completely <laughs> and putting it beside the lexicon, that is the lexical dictionary of the New Testament, I thought, oh boy, you guys aren't going to survive this one. So I better just bring word meanings in the New Testament, uh, one volume edition, so it's all in here. Yay! Ralph Earl. So basically, you've got every book of the New Testament, and he highlights some of the words. Now, let me just say a footnote. If you have the theological dictionary of the New Testament, and if you have the lexicon, the lexical work by, I believe it's by Spick, uh, the, uh, what I've brought out, those two different volumes, they contradict each other. So I decided, enough confusion, we'll just go somewhere in the middle. So here we are in um, this Baker book, and the word justified. <clears throat> the verb, dikaiu, justify, occurs in verse 20, and I'm reading, by the way, if you were trying to follow this page by page through each book of the Bible, this occurs in 320, in Romans 320. Our text is 324 and so forth, but he's using the word justified from 320. If you, if you were curious to know how, how did I get to this page in this book, in case some of you would like to uh, look or peruse at some point, justified. The verb dikaiu, or dikaiu, justify, occurs in verse 20 for the third time in this epistle. 
that would be also in 2.13 and 4.3. It's found 39 times in the New Testament, 27 in Paul's epistles, six in Luke's two writings, three times in James, and those are interesting, by the way, because they have no similarity whatsoever. Two in Matthew and once in Revelation. So the emphasis here you can see is heavily Pauline. <clears throat> Because Dikaiu is central to the message of Romans, a more extended treatment of it is in order. The verb comes from the adjective dikaios. In early Greek writers, this was used of persons, observant of dike, custom, rule, right, righteous in performing duties to gods and men. Thayer, all of these names I'm going to mention, these are all outstanding scholars in the field. If you were to peruse a library, you'd find these names. Thayer says the adjective means righteous, observing divine and human laws, one who is such as he ought to be, and so approved by God, acceptable to God. Kremer, another scholar, observes righteousness in the biblical sense is a condition of rightness, the standard of which is God, which is estimated according to the divine standard, which shows itself in behavior conformable to God and has to do above all with the things in relation to God and with the walk before him. In other words, according to the Bible, uh, one that is right is only right when he's right with God. That is a strong preaching point. The verb dikaiu is defined by Abbot Smith, another one of these great names of scholarly work, in its New Testament and Septuagint uses. So Septuagint, obviously, that Greek translation of the second, third, uh, century before Christ of the Hebrew text and apocryphal into the Greek language from the Hebrew, purportedly done by 70-some scholars. So, Abbot Smith says to show, to be righteous, to declare, to pronounce righteous. See, there's so many folks that are scholars that have nuances of opinion. And a person sitting, listening to me may, may say, well, what does it matter? What does it matter? Just tell me, why does it matter? I'll tell you why. Because if you begin to divide the understanding of this, some scholars are sifting down and gestalting just two camps. Some will either say that God imputes his righteousness to you as a believer, while other camps hold to a more Hebraic frame and say you are made the righteousness of God. And the two camps essentially go back and forth. You see, if God cannot completely, using a Scotism, righteousify a person, then you're only half done. <laughs> that may not seem like a big difference to you, but if you have a sensitive soul and you sit at nighttime sometimes talking to God, like I do many nights talking to God, I don't want to be half done. I mean, I may not be completed while I'm here, but I want to be completed while I'm over there, but whatever God is doing, I want it to be done to the fullness. I don't want to be half. Never mind. You could only appreciate that if you were in my mind right now. <laughs> Thayer notes that the proper meaning, according to the analogy of other verbs ending in the OO, the Greek ending, is to make dikaios, to render righteous, or such as he ought to be. But he thinks this meaning is extremely rare, if not altogether doubtful. He holds that the normal usage is to show, to exhibit, to evince one to be righteous, such as he is and wishes himself to be considered. Now listen, I can wish myself to be righteous, but that isn't going to do anything before God. We're told our righteousness is as filthy rags. You remember we had a guest here, not here, but downtown, had a, it was a doctor friend of Dr. Scott's, and I've told you this many times, she came and she sat on the front row, she was his, uh, his uh, not chemotherapy lady, but uh, his radiologist, the treatment, the laser, whatever that treatment was, the photons or whatever that he went for, uh, she, she said, I love righteousness, and then she kind of slipped in that she loved being righteous, and then when it was asked of her, she kind of let out that it was her righteousness. So we left, we left it alone. And you think that some people have a caricature of God? Mind you, if you came from the Judaic frame, 
and she did, it would make perfect sense because your good works, your mitzvahs, your good acts and good deeds make you a, your acts of tzedakah and mitzvah make you in the Hebraic and Judaic tradition righteous before God because it's a whole system of legal works. Do and do and do. All right, so his conclusion is that dikaio means to declare, to pronounce, one to be just, righteous, or such as he ought to be, negatively, negatively. He declares guiltless, positively, to judge, to declare, to pronounce, righteous, and therefore acceptable. Now, this is rather interesting because he, he quotes a whole bunch of scholars, but I want to read the one that kind of will, will get you to see why I said half and half. Vincent is another famous scholar, word scholar. If you ever go into a theological bookstore, you'll see word studies by Vincent. Vincent has stated uh, something like this. He discusses the classical usage of dikayu, noting that the primitive meaning is to make right. Then it came to mean to judge a thing to be right, and in the New Testament indicates the act or process by which a man is brought into right state as related to God. He further says, justification aims directly at character. It contemplates making the man himself right. Coming to grips then with the issue noted above, Vincent makes this fine statement of the case. Quote, justification which does not actually remove the wrong condition in man, which is at the root of his enmity to God, is no justification. The absence of this, a legal declaration that the man is right, is a fiction. Let me take all of this now because there's, you know, there's a good amount of scholars that are chiming in here and just say one thing, that either God declares a thing to be, like when he spoke and said light be and there was, he either declares a thing to be and it is, or we don't understand God's word and it's not, and therefore we're, we're still in our sins. The idea here to me, simply put, between Romans 3 and Romans 5, is that while I was yet a sinner, and I'm speaking of in that dark room, not yet illuminated, that the idea that Jesus Christ went to the cross, it should have been me, it should have been you, the idea that he stood in my place, and he took the wrath, he took everything that was coming to me, and I, I think to myself, if there's any way to communicate to people, the only thing that we are receiving when God declares this, he declares us to be his righteousness because of Christ's act. Something crystallizes in my mind. Christ's merits become my merits. Christ's suffering, oh, here's the one no one wants to hear. Christ's suffering become my suffering. And those sufferings indeed are mine that I may also experience the glories that may follow. Remember that lesson out of 1 Peter? So. I lined these up and I said, at the very least, I'm going to show two things today out of three texts. Number one, how a man or woman is saved. It's not by some exercise and some special. Here we have a concept plain and simple. As God spoke to Abraham, and Abraham faithed, he amen God, and God declared him to be righteous. Let me ask you a question if you're familiar with the story of Abraham. Did Abraham from that point on when he was declared righteous by God, it was, it was accounted to him. Did he stop being a liar? Did he stop? This is why I can't figure out the rest of the world looks on and says, but you preach too difficult a message. No, I preached the truth about your journey as a pilgrim here. That we can sit and pray and ask God, help me to do better, change me, God. That's my prayer all the time. God, change me, make me something I'm not. Help me out here, God. Right? And we can grapple with that in our minds, but the very things that we, we don't like about ourselves, we ourselves are not able to remove and say, well, I cast this out of myself. <laughs> That's on another network, I think. <laughs> What I'm trying to say to you is this activity is of God to the believer. And when we look at this activity, I think to myself, passively, and this aorist concept for the two verses, those two last verses, but the first one 
is present, which is ongoing. Let's go back to that for a minute now because I want to highlight something. All right. So in the present, that means ongoing, you are receiving ongoing by his grace. I'm going to highlight three things now to show you being justified, having been justified by faith. And the last one, so I don't have to go to another page, I'll write in black down here, which would be 5-9, which is by his blood. <clears throat> now you can see why I said I have a sermon with three texts, but really one message. This, you know, if you took these texts and you only had these to work on, you could find yourself easily understanding the whole counsel of God. Being freely, that is his gift to us, made right, that is ongoing by his grace, by the means of the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. That means that Christ's redemptive work, I love this, in this case, to make me in right standing is ongoing. It's an ongoing thing. You know, the Baptists have their one saved, always saved. I have this idea right here I'm looking at that says, God's doing an ongoing work on me. And it's an ongoing work that I passively, I, but I am receiving it. I do nothing to merit it. You know, I, I, I see some of these folks that talk about their achievements in the body of Christ, and they remind me of, you know, birds with fancy plumage, and I'm thinking, can somebody get over there and pluck that bird? <laughs> so that we can all stand on the same level, which is ugly flesh pots that are in desperate need of a savior. <laughs> now, to the Apostle Paul, to the Apostle Paul, I love the fact, and really, I have to confess to you that this, th these that I've highlighted in, in green, being made right on an ongoing basis by his grace, and this activity in the past, uh, passively by faith and by his blood, I have a few of you in mind. Because believe it or not, Every once in a while, I'll have talks with some of you. I meet you in the hallway or see you somewhere. <clears throat> and you let me know that you're as human as the rest of us, including me. That there are days when you think, don't put a camera on anybody, please. How many of you in the last week thought, maybe God has taken his hand off of you? Show me your hand. I gave you two. We all have those. You know, maybe, maybe I need to be more like this. By the way, that's the sensitive soul always trying to search out, how do I please him more? How, how without becoming the works frame, how do I please him more? Well, the Bible says clearly without faith, it's impossible to please God. Everything else, it may come as a result of God's indwelling spirit through you, in you, through you, but the whole core of activity is based on you plugging that famous and great example of you plugging into the circuit that feeds the power, the power source. That is you remaining in Christ, faithing. I love the fact that if I just took this first verse at 324, that ongoing, I am a recipient daily being made in right standing by his grace. And I think there could be no greater example of a man who would understand this than the writer of this epistle himself, who in 2 Corinthians is quoting what God is saying to him, my grace is sufficient for thee. You know, sometimes I think we tend to dehumanize the people in the Bible. And the times, the sensitive times where you're sitting and you're thinking, I just don't know how I can get over this one. The same voice that spoke to Paul yet speaks to us through his word. My grace is sufficient for thee. So daily, his grace, his unmerited favor, his unconditional love, his uncalculated giving you a chance to get up and try again, daily being 
daily, hourly, some of us it's minute by minute, being stamped in right standing. I love the idea that I, I understand what I look like before him, and as long as I am in him and remain faithing in him, he looks at me and he knows all about me, but he doesn't see me the way I, I might see myself, foul and vile. He sees me through the eyes of faith, white as snow. That's why I said to you, let no person discourage you on your walk and your approach into God's kingdom. With all the diverse personalities I've met in the last few years, I think it's always the ones who put themselves up on a soapbox, so ready to condemn, so ready to put you down for your past mistakes. You know, there isn't a person in this sanctuary, including me, who may not have great, deep sorrow for the life they lived before they came to know about God. But that is the godly sorrow that produces repentance, that makes you turn around and say, I am a recipient of his grace. I no longer need to walk like a crippled child that can't figure out I will ever be whole again. I'm made whole. That act of grace does that. So when I read this, I think, and it's, it's ongoing. Some of you might think you've slipped a little too far. I'm thinking of at least one person in this uh, congregation who constantly laments they've slipped so far, they don't know if they can get back. I don't know if they're a perpetual drama queen or if it's a real thing, but I hope what I'm saying will turn on some lights that this grace that is given to us that puts us in right standing is done on a regular basis. And we don't have to go and try and reach up to God and bring him down or go and find him in some death, depth. He's with us. So I think the first one is salve to the soul for anyone who feels like, oh, well, you, you don't have any idea. No, but God does. And that's why this beautiful picture from the mouth of Paul, inspired by the Holy Spirit, that I am seen in right standing before him, continuous, and I'm the recipient. That makes me, forgive me for using some of these words, but that, that makes me feel like a child of privilege. It should make you feel like a child of privilege too, that you know deep in your heart you don't deserve it, but then if you could earn it, it wouldn't be grace. The beauty of this. The next one that I've highlighted in green from this trilogy here. Therefore, being justified, having been made right by faith. Remember I said to you that's an, an activity in the past, and it's passive. You say, well, how does that work? It means that back there, somewhere back there, now don't say once saved, always saved, somewhere back there, the activity that first made you turn, that first act of turning, now, faith is required on a daily basis. You can't say yesterday's faith will carry you into today or last week or last month. It's daily. You are faithing. You go back to the source every day. You plug in every day. But if you look at this aright, having been made right by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And so if the first one represents my privilege in Christ, this one represents my promise to have peace with God. And I love the fact as I look, I look at this and I think to myself, can anybody grab hold of this idea just for a second? When I go back and I read Hebrews 11 and I read of all the heroes of faith and I read about all of their great feats and everything that they did and that whole chapter is by faith, by faith, by faith. And you read the very end of that, and it's kind of like a, hmm. They all died not having obtained the promise that we have, but they all obtained a good report. They all died, and it's a by faith chronicle. Now, you tell me, for those people that wrestle down, they think somehow, you know, well, we'll, we'll, do, we'll engage in some works. We'll have something to show God. You want to show God something? You're going to be surprised because it means you don't recognize what he's shown you. I think 
That's so simple, and I just said something you've heard many, many times in different ways, but to me, this one registers the greatest truth of all. Let me say it again. If you think that your salvation is a 50-50 act, you do 50%, Christ did this and you have to do that, you understand nothing about the heart of God and why Christ came. That full understanding, I'm not sure any of us will fully wrap our minds around ever, but the best thing I can tell you is, by faith, not by works, lest any man should boast. By faith. When we read, for example, I just referenced Abraham. When we read about Abraham, I could talk to you better yet. Let me talk to you about Noah. Noah, by faith, God said, build an ark. No law. <laughs> well, you've got to keep the law. But there was no law then. Build an ark. You've never seen rain? Probably never seen an ark like that before. I mean, think about it. If you were told to go out and build a sports car with wings and, a, you know, it can fly, it can go in the water, and God instructed you, I don't know, please don't, don't take this as instruction. But you'd never seen anything like that before, but you just followed what God told you to do. By faith, probably looked like a lunatic, but by faith you did what God instructed you to do for whatever the purpose was. Now, go stick to the Bible. By faith, Noah, it says, Noah found favor or grace in God's sight, builds this ark, new beginnings for the family of God, but it was all an act of faith. And I think the great parallel, I'm sorry I don't teach on Noah more often, the great parallel of Noah is that he actually had some tangible things to work with. There was a real flood. There, there was a real smell of death in the air. I said, I'm sorry I don't teach on that more often because I think most people come into the church and there's a great complacency to not grab hold of these words and actually take them, their, medic, their medication for the soul, and take them by faith. I once asked somebody, by faith, do you, do you really believe what the Word of God says concerning life eternal? Well, I sure hope so. That was the response. I sure hope so. Well, why are you a Christian then? You'd be much better off practicing something else than Christianity. If you're not sure about what you believe and the basis for our faith begins with this incredible miracle that had it not occurred, the basis for Christianity goes right out the window. The resurrection of Jesus Christ. I think to myself, if you don't believe that is the starting point and he rose with enough implication to tell us this is what yet awaits you. Well, what about Lazarus? He ended up dying. Yeah, the natural death that we all must die. Hello. It's like those people that they say, oh, somebody had a great miracle and they died. Yeah, God didn't promise you will live here forever. Who would want to? <laughs> Again, you? <laughs> Can you imagine that? Now, there are some, I've seen a couple of people. I was on the west side and I've seen a couple of people walking in the streets. They look like they've been alive forever. But it's Hollywood. Just put a little embalming fluid and they walk around. <laughs> Pump them full of Botox or whatever, I don't know. <laughs> By faith. <laughs> By faith. That is my promise. We have peace with God. We're no longer at enmity. God is no longer against us and we are no longer against God in, in the matter of reconciliation. And lastly, and this may be the one I want to highlight the most, the text there, much more than having been justified or made right now by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. And I highlight this by his blood as I said, these three texts give you a complete picture. If you knew nothing else, you could walk away saying, I've got enough goods here to keep bathing and make it in. That there's no works, there's no merits, there's no other activity except for bathing. But by his blood caught my attention. I stayed, you ever open the Bible and you stay, you stay stuck on a text and you keep coming back to it and you don't know why you keep reading the same text over and over again? Well, the one that 
caught my mind and then I understood why I was reading it over and over again was so many times through the scriptures we read about the blood, his shed blood. And we know his shed blood cleanses us from all unrighteousness. His shed blood. We have redemption through his blood. We understand that cleansing power. But it dawned on me as I was looking at this other text in Exodus. You know the one of the first Passover where they're told to apply the blood? And it's not the angel of the Lord. It's the Lord himself that says, when I see the blood, when I see the blood, not when the angel, well, not when the death angel sees it, when I see the blood, I'll pass over your house. And I thought, these two texts bring together a concept that is so powerful for the believer that every single sin, past, present, and future, God still sees the same concept. When I see the blood, only now it's the blood applied to your heart. Christ is formed in your heart by faith. You appropriate by faith the finished work at Calvary. When we approach this scripture, I think to myself, by his blood, by his shed blood, I am moved out of the realm of being a recipient of his wrath. Like the children of Israel, and I think like the children of Israel, they had never seen something like this before. They'd never experienced something like this before. Although death had been and plagues had been in the land, they'd never experienced this concept before. Apply the blood exactly as I've said, and I, the Lord speaking, when I see the blood, I will pass over your house. Still today, I know people get repulsed when, when we speak about the blood, but I think, how could you get repulsed if you understand the meaning of this and the verity of through Scripture, through Scripture over and over again. But that one Scripture I read in Exodus, it stayed with me, and I thought, and today, applying the blood, we're not, it's not as though we have to go through an activity or a ritual, but rather with the heart that looks much like when we go to the table of the Lord, that looks to the cup representing his shed blood, representing a finished act, that then as I go to that table, I'm not looking at me, I'm looking at that cup and I'm thinking, this helps me to look beyond myself, looking only to him. And regardless of how the world sees you as a believer, regardless of how the world sees Melissa Scott or Dr. Scott or any person in the sound of my voice, that activity of looking to the shed blood of Jesus Christ cleanses and makes me whole, cleanses you of every sin, of every part, every bit. There's no 50-50 like, well, maybe just a little bit. And you begin to walk in the understanding that walk of faith says, I have appropriated that, and it is his unmerited favor, the grace that rains down supreme on the believer that as you go, like the children of Israel in that depiction of the Exodus, you are ready for the pilgrimage of faith, that surely along the way you will encounter, we have our share, by the way, of Amalekites and all the other ites that attack us along the way in our journey. But God gave this beautiful picture, this, as I've called it, a trilogy, the privilege of his grace, the promise by faith, and this beautiful process through his blood that let me know as God looks at me, the concept of being justified or being made right, I could never be made right on my own. Oh, trust me, before I met Dr. Scott, before I started listening, I tried a couple of times. Didn't work. In fact, it made things exponentially worse. Some of you have done the same. But as I begin to mature and understand the, the, the last words of the Apostle Peter in his epistle, grow in grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The more I walk by faith, the more I understand I'm a recipient of that unmerited favor. And all of that is due to the fact that he shed his blood for me. I don't try and make this big statement so we can all fit under a blanket. You personalize it for you that when you leave here today, not, this is not a message for tomorrow. I pray it lasts you tomorrow and through the week and through next week. But when you leave here today, you're no longer frustrating the grace of God saying, I know, but I just feel, I just feel, I just, I don't feel like I'm cleansed. Can I tell you, there's nothing better than 
understanding what I've just described, and then see how the world, the flesh, and the devil will come to combat what I've just laid out as the greatest understanding and simplicity of the salvation of your soul. The world comes and says, you cannot see that you're cleansed from your sin. As far as we can tell, it's still upon you. In fact, many from the world and the church would like to come and remind you of your sins and remind you of your mistakes. The flesh? The flesh then has some, oh, it's this, this thing called war because we can't just settle the matter that God said a thing and declared me to be and therefore I stand. The flesh says, oh, but... You know, those, those temptations, those ideas, those thoughts, those activities, whatever it is that the flesh can reach up and try and basically have dominion over you, over the spirit person. And then lastly, and my favorite one, is Satan. Against everything I've just said, you know, you've been too bad. You don't deserve this. In fact, you would have had to have lived a better life in order to qualify for all this. Just give it up. You're a loser and you'll always be a loser. You're a mess up and you'll always be a mess up. Your life will always be a mess. But guess what? There's good news. I'm speaking as though I was Satan. There's good news because I accept you. I think you're great. I think you have potential. Now you know why I, I, I make fun at a lot of these ministries, but that is exactly the voice of Satan coming to tell you, you're okay. No, you're not. The reality is any child that comes before God recognizes I'm filthy. I'm standing in his white purity, in his holiness, in his majesty, in his presence, and I'd like to reduce him down to uh, my, you know, this is my pal. We cut jokes together, and uh, my, my dirtiness is really not dirtiness at, at, at all. No, I must convince myself that my sin is not sin, and then I can, I can rationalize, and I can feel good, and I can go about my life. That's the voice of Satan talking. Now, I'm not a perfectionist. Don't get me wrong. I don't believe there's any capacity for you or for I to function as perfect individuals in this lifetime. We're being brought to completion. And in the process, this is why this message is really very important. As long as I, with my eyeballs, look to him, I say with my eyeballs because much like those children in the wilderness that were told all they had to do is look upon the brazen serpent. That's all they had to do. Just look upon the brazen serpent and they would be saved. Nothing else. The sickness of sin is still alive today in every man and woman's body and will not be conquered in its entirety until this crock of Adam is laid down. So the next time you come back to these passages, and especially for those of you who wrestle with your faith, and believe me, I know who you are. Some of you I talk to, and some of you I just read the letters, and others I just know I need to pray for. And it's a long list. <laughs> I want you to see the message I've painted here today, that this passive stamping onto you of his approval, of your standing before him in rightness, not because you earned it, not because you worked for it, but because you trusted his finished and complete work. And for that beautiful tapestry, three concepts that I've nailed out as a passive recipient, I cannot tell you it brings comfort to me, so I know it'll bring comfort to you. His grace, by his grace, by faith, through his blood, these bring together a whole concept of salvation. So if any person says to you, well, what, what works do you do? Oh, wait a minute, I'll read it to you, because it's so good. It's like one of those, but wait, there's more. I'll read it to you. See if my mind's working good today. All right, in Titus and verse, chapter three, rather, it says, for we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving diverse lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. This is the writer, Paul, speaking. But after that the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness, righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, 
which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, that being justified by his grace, there it is again, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. You know, it becomes doctrine when it's repeated, when, you, when the scripture confirms itself. And I'm telling you, these are confirmed through and through. Don't let anybody deceive you that somehow you've got to work your way into the kingdom. The only thing that will do, if you want to try and add works to your list, Try and sell that to God when you stand before him because what it, it says, and I'll repeat it again, it says, your son dying on the cross was not enough for me. I had to do something more. And that, my friends, is blasphemy. Now, for the ones who are ready to accept and receive, I pray comfort for your souls today that the communion of the blood of Christ that makes us whole will be a clearer and more tender understanding God has finished the work for you. Being made right, he makes us right. Thank God. That's my message. I'm Pastor Melissa Scott, pastor of Faith Center, Glendale, California. I teach every Sunday morning at 11 a.m., if you'd like to attend services with us, simply call the 800 number, that is 800-338-3030, to join us. If you'd like to watch, listen, and learn 24 hours a day, simply log on to our website at www.pastormelissascott.com.